The National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America, presents U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having farmers receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century, NFO Collective Bargaining for Agriculture. Special guests on U.S. Farm Report are Monsignor Lewis J. Miller, National Catholic Rural Life Director of South Dakota, and Erhard Fingston, Vice President of the National Farmers Organization. Here now is Vice President Fingston. Today we have with us on this U.S. Farm Report a very distinguished man, Monsignor Miller from Elkton, South Dakota. He's a director of the National Catholic Rural Life Conference. Monsignor, the National Catholic Rural Life Conference has uh, concerned itself very much with the problem that we have in agriculture and what uh, is, it is doing to the entire of rural America. Would you tell us why and the church's view on this problem? Uh, Erhard, uh, perhaps it would be well to indicate that for about 40 years, the church has been vitally concerned about people on the land because she regards in this day and age yet that the family is the primary institution and that stewardship of the land <coughs> must be planned with the family in view. And for that reason, uh, and the reason is that uh, there is a special adaptability of the farm home for nurturing strong and wholesome family life. And I think it's the reason for the universal interest in regard to land use and uh, rural welfare. In other words, the, the farm is the native habitat of the family. And that's the reason why the church is concerned about it, because uh, whenever you can uh, enable a family to exercise its initiative and responsibility in the stewardship of land, you have a situation that is good for people. Yes, just to kind of comment on that a little bit, I think it brings out in a roundabout way we have, as a nation, come to the point where we're now trying to make the, uh, the people serve the dollar and are forgetting the importance of the people themselves, that this is what it's all about, the welfare of people everywhere. Yes. Um, let's put it this way. <clears throat> and that would come, I think, under the title of the, the future of this family on the land. Uh, I don't have to remind you, Erhard, or any of you in the public, that... Uh, in this country, we have inherited in this generation a family farm system of agriculture due to the fact that for our people wanted land, we had land to give away, and we had a national policy that saw to it that land came into the hands of families. Uh, the, our present situation perhaps could best be uh, oh, dramatically stated by an experience I had recently up at the University of Fargo in North Dakota. I was scheduled to address a group of clergy at a three-day uh, three clergy conference at the university on the subject of the, the family farm and a changing community. Well, I didn't know at the time that a week before, the Chamber of Commerce of that good city of Fargo had sponsored an agribusiness uh, forum for several days. And the head of the, or the two speakers on the program, one was the head of J.I. Case Company, which is controlled, as you know, by Kern County Land Company of California. And the other speaker was the head of the Board of Trade in Chicago, whose clients make their money after the farmers are foolish enough to give their stuff away for three quarters of what it's worth. And the headlines in the Fargo Forum, the week before, read by all the clergy who were attending this conference, read, quote, family farm concept has been displaced. Now, these are not, uh, these are intelligent people, Erhard. I mean, they have, in their thinking, they have phased out family agriculture, and you and I are supposed to be in the business of resurrection. Well, I think <laughs> the, way it, the way it is moving, I think it has been done unless that... Uh, 
we come about with a marketing system that does put the farmer into a position. If uh, barring that, I think it has been done. It's just a matter of cleanup from that point on. I like the, uh, the talk that John Galbraith gave at Wisconsin, oh, it was about 10 years ago now. But what he has to say, I think, is still valid even more so today. And he speaks of the choices that we have in agriculture. And one of them, he says, involves the factorization of agriculture. And he points out that if, uh, speaking especially to our state university of agriculture, he says uh, that if they are promoting this kind of uh, specialization and huge collectivization of animals and specialization, grain, all that kind of thing, he warns them that they should be honest with the American public and not speak of mere adjustment, you know, to changing technology. But he says they should speak of a total uh, revolution because it involves the uprooting, as the CED report <laughs> indicated, of two million families. And I talked to an economist the other day up at our state college, the head of our economics department, and he told me that the CED report removing two million from the farm is now regarded as conservative. So, uh, this is this is uh, is what we're headed for unless we wake up. And then he goes on to say that the other alternative, and it's one that he calls a, an agriculture of compassion, he says would involve and could involve an agriculture of modest-sized commercial units. But then he goes on to say that if that is going to be, we would have to have a national government policy on behalf of such a modest-sized agricultural plant. And then he further uh, uh, indicates that uh, these modest-sized operators would have to uh, agree in some way to work together in order to protect their own interests. Even after they get uh, real big in size, it's still going to take mutual cooperation. At that point, and of course, uh, as you well know, this is what we of the NFO have been driving to, is to get the farmers to cooperate and protect what they have. But not just the farmers themselves, I think it's the entire rural America. What's your view on that, how it's going to affect the rest of uh, the rural towns, all of the Midwest, in fact? Of course, uh, I guess to predict anything is, uh, is quite hazardous. But uh, I've lived out in South Dakota for 26 years. And during that time, I have seen this happen. When I first came out there, thousands of families used to have a meat chicken check. You know, uh, Saturday nights, uh, the wife would come in to town with two or three uh, dozen or a couple crates of uh, meat chicken and uh, sell them at the local produce store. And that little check, uh, in the course of a year, maybe meant from 200 to 500 to 800 or 1,000 dollars for thousands of families. Well, that disappeared uh, a number of years ago already. So that cash is no longer in the community. Well, See? I can really attest to that. A good part of my education was paid for through uh, that old egg check and those chickens that you're talking about. My mother did it. And today, if she were alive, I imagine uh, she would starve to death herself on what she could make out of chickens and eggs to say nothing about raising a family and educating them. Well, let's go a little further. I mean, uh, in the last couple of years, I've seen the egg check go. And the egg check in South, eastern South Dakota for 10,000 or more families meant all the way from 500 to uh, two, three, four, five thousand dollars and I talked to one of the better uh, hatchery men in the center of our state. They hatched their last eggs about a week or two ago, and they're out of the business. And of course, the reason is, my one lady, the head of a big uh, consumer group in California, told me that outside of Los Angeles, there's one factory of one million hens under one roof. So uh, in other words, I've seen meat poultry factory eyes, eggs are practically factoryized, they are now trying to apply the same principles of factorization to hogs and cattle. And one of the recent figures I read that in feedlots, 44% uh, of all feedlot cattle are now in lots of over 1,000. And the way I, li I think maybe the impact can best be brought uh, across to you people is that we are in danger 
particularly in the Midwest, of losing not just our egg livestock industry or our meat poultry livestock industry, we are in danger of losing our entire livestock industry. And when that happens, or if we permit, or if the American public permits this to happen as, as, as a, a national calamity, I just ask you people in rural America, you businessmen, you small town uh, merchants of various kinds who are in the, very, in the same plight as the farmer, what is left to be done if the chickens and the hogs and the cattle are in huge concentrations? What's left to be done to the people out in the, in, in, uh, on the countryside? There's only one thing, and that is the raising of raw grain and uh, grains with huge modern equipment. Uh, don't need near the personnel that uh, a modern diversified farming operation requires. Now, getting back into what you <coughs> were pointing out there, that uh, it was not unusual to have a $5,000 check, let's say, for a year for a farmer off of these, uh, the chicken, the egg business, and so forth. Now, what I wanted to bring out here is that it affects the man on Main Street who thinks he doesn't have anything involved out there in the country because this five thousand dollars is something that that farmer or no other farmer in that community is going to spend with the businessmen up and down main street so uh, they go along with it i think the most recent figure that i saw on how it affects the rural town one of the agricultural colleges put out the statement that for every five families that leave rural america one businessman has to go with them or all of them take a proportionate cut in income. And I think this should uh, kind of be, or the fact that the rural community is not keeping up with the increase in the population, that the rural community is declining in population while the industrial centers are growing, I think is evidence of this. But since you pointed out there that the livestock industry could very well go the same way or that the plan is there, I would like to point out what the situation is in meat right at this day that I think is a very alarming situation. In the years gone by, of course, basically every uh, farmer was a livestock producer. And when we had that situation, we here in America, or the farmers in America, were producing all of the meat that this nation needs. But since 1952, for 15 years, or over 15 years, there has not been one single year, not one, that we have produced enough to feed our own nation. We've uh, started importing to make up what the American farmer was not producing till in uh, 1965. I believe we got up to where we were importing about 14, 15 percent of all of the meat consumed in the United States. And uh, today we are even much beyond that. And the only reason it is important is because we're not producing enough. Certainly they're not piling it up here. So we have actually, while we're claiming to be such great benefactors to the hungry people of this world, we're actually robbing hungry people of this world by retiring our own acres here, which would produce the grain that would feed this livestock and importing it from somewhere else. And I'd like to go just a little beyond that and show you how intensive this is. If we had last year produced all of the meat that the people of this nation needed, it would have taken 15% more grain and 15% more roughage. Now, at the very height of our government programs, when we retired the most acres to alleviate the farm problem through the supply and demand system, we uh, retired 11% of the productive acres, just 11%. So it would have taken last year or in 60, 66 and 65, 15% more grain and 15% more roughage. So with all those acres brought back into production, we could not have produced that meat. So we do have the market here for it, and we would actually be helping the situation in the rest of the world if we did do that. But I'm bringing this in merely to point out that we are definitely on the way, not only of eliminating that production from the Midwest or from rural America, but we're actually becoming dependent on other nations in this world for a decided part of our meat supply. And in relation to that same point, uh, Earhart, I think <clears throat> there's a long range effect of this factorization of agriculture that we have not given sufficient uh, thought to. And that is that I mean, once you get all your animals congested in one area, I mean in, in huge concentrations, 
uh, we end up specializing in grains in the soil. And I remember on the way to Ames when uh, this spring, driving through a dust storm and, what, and seeing all the wind erosion in the ditches, that we drove, and this is, God help me, this is true, uh, another fellow and I drove 47 minutes before we saw a patch of grass, uh, about 40 acres of bone grass. Uh, and no animals. There were no chickens to be seen, no cattle, no hogs. And we picked up the Des Moines Register <laughs> in a filling station, and a great big headline, something to the effect, black dust clouds over Iowa. And the reporter was interviewing uh, two soil conservation specialists. <laughs> and the soil conservation specialists were asked, well, what can we do to, to prevent this soil erosion? And he estimated that it was one-eighth of, of an inch from 15 million acres in one day, equivalent to 22 farms, 1,000 acres of, uh, each, seven inches deep, blew off in one day. And the soil conservation men said it would require three things keeping the ground on top rough, keeping your stubble mulch on top, and putting back, uh, well, you use a cultural word for it, uh, manure, <laughs> back on the soil. Well, where are you going to get the manure when all the cattle are in factories, the pigs are in factories, the chickens are in factories? And uh, in other words, what, we've, what this specialization and factorization of agriculture has already done, it's begun to rob the next generation of fertile soil. I mean, yeah. uh, this is something that uh, you people out there, you may not be on farms, but the, your children, the next generation, are going to have the food, to need the food from these farms. Well, I think in this connection, I know very well what you are talking about, about those dust. I was breathing them, so I know that they were there. But I think we might go back to the 30s when your state of South Dakota practically emptied out right. on account of this dust storm. And uh, at that time, we had reached about the same point where through low farm prices, the effort was being made to take everything that you could possibly get off to where the water was no longer being held up, nothing there to stop this erosion. And so in the 33, when that dust storm began, on a Sunday afternoon that fall, by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it was so dark in western Iowa, about, I would say, 40 miles from the South Dakota line. I was at Onawa at that time, that we needed lights in mid-afternoon to see. Yeah. And then through those dust storms or drainage ditches there, just leveled off, and the fence rows that did have weeds or grass in them, they drifted just like snowbanks did at that time. Well, I think if you, those who would remember anything at all about what it did to the economy of South Dakota, it was literally destroyed at that time when the people started leaving, started going out. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think it even has to be for dust storms to drive them out. If they leave for any other reason, I think you'd have the same economic effect on South Dakota or any area in the Midwest, because after all, it's the people there that keep the community, that build the schools, the uh, churches, right. everything involved there. And then in the long run, as far as I'm concerned, this nation was built on agriculture, and I think it's the very basis of it. Uh, it is through the Homestead Act that you uh, mentioned earlier in the program that the <coughs> land was given out to these people and got it to settle. And and uh, you had the, the very reverse program there to get the land in the hands of the individual. And now when you reverse that situation, I think we'll go just exactly the other way. And you know, there's an interesting, or it's a rather an ironic thing. I talked to a fellow who came back from uh, the Peace Corps down in Brazil. He was down there for two years, and he was indicating that practically every communication they got from the uh, Department of Agriculture here in the United States was urging these people to get on the land. And here we are in this country because of a lack of a national policy with regard to the kind of an enterprise we should have to produce our food and fiber. We don't have a policy. And like Braymeyer, uh, Professor Braymeyer says, we're drifting into a factoryized type of agriculture. And you people in the city uh, aren't going to be given a right to vote for what you want either. And we had our whole legislature in action last year to determine uh, whether or not you should be allowed to shoot turtle doves in South Dakota. And we decided finally, after due deliberation, that you could. 
But American people are not being given the chance, or they have the chance, but nothing's being done about it uh, to enable them to determine what kind of an agriculture we should have. Factories in the field or people or an agriculture with compassion. And uh, I think this, uh, this is a matter of concern for everybody, whether you're on a farm or whether you're in the city. Because uh, uh, you might say a word about um, this whole misunderstanding, you know, with regard to efficiency. You've got a lot of people, a lot of clergymen and businessmen who are actually confused. They're accepting this, this centralization and, and factorization of agriculture on the basis that it's supposed to be efficient. Yes. Uh, now, I, I think that should be clarified. On this national policy that you mentioned, uh, Leon Kaiserling, who is probably the most quoted economist in the United States and was formerly the head of of the, or the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, I think his, I like his term even better. He says we're flying blind. And I think this is what uh, we are doing exactly, no long-range program at all. But uh, it, it's, it's all of America. As you mentioned here in foreign countries, we have a policy, and this is a national policy of ours to make it possible for these people in depressed countries to get that land back, to get it out of these enormous hold, the holdings. And this annoys right. me no end right. that actually in this country we have the complete reverse of this situation here. We're telling them they got to get bigger and bigger and bigger and there is no end. First they told us when we were operating with two row equipment we had to get four row equipment. Then they started talking about six row, oh. then eight row, and a lot of numbers left yet. There's no end to that, and actually there are none of us doing anywhere near as well as when we were operating on the smaller scale. And I think uh, this may not be a popular idea, but uh, I think farmers should realize that uh, these ad men, you know, who uh, are selling this huge equipment and everything else, they appeal to the farmer's pride, you know, be a big profit corn farmer, show your neighbor what a big pull you got, so what does the farmer do who falls for that? And many of them have. Mr. Butts told the Illinois Association of Cooperatives of what was happening. And he reminded them by falling for that big image and forgetting about the needs of other people who would like to farm also, see? What happens? They end up with a capital structure so large that uh, they have laid the groundwork for the takeover by investor capital. In other words, Johnny looks at the nice big three hundred thousand dollar complex his bad his dad built and uh he's got a college education he wants to farm but man three hundred thousand bucks he can't command that kind of capital so actually entry into agriculture <laughs> is going to end up if you're uh, wise enough to choose a father and, uh, and mother who own a big spread then you'll be in farming and those are the only people who will be in farming so that the, the big operator really, and the sinful pride oftentimes that the farmer falls for is, uh, is laying the groundwork for his own destruction. Well, I think actually a good many of them are lying to themselves, ra really, when it comes to how well that they're doing. They have the belief, you know, that the big boy is doing fine, which just simply does, the figures just simply doesn't bear, don't bear out. The figures that came out a year or two ago came from the Department of Internal Revenue showed that actually a smaller percentage of the enormously large uh, farms were making, uh, showing any profit at all, much smaller than uh, the family type farm. So I think they're being deceived and I think something that should be brought out here when you're talking about this efficiency in these corporation farms, which is so highly recommended, that they're not making this money in agriculture. This is money coming from outside sources. The enormously large corporation that you mentioned before, that's rubber, uh, rubber money and oil money, that kind of money coming in there. And they're not making it either. So the problem really is purely and simply nothing else but price right here in America. Our forefathers didn't have any trouble improving this land and building these uh, farms up. And now with the prices that we have today, we can't even keep them up after they have been built. So I think the real problem is price, and this is what we're going to have to work on and restore that price structure. And, of course, and here is a, an area that sometimes farmers don't like to think about, but uh, 
like any other people, they live in a society, and above all, in our age, it's an organized society. And many farmers haven't quite grasped that yet. That if, uh, if other groups have organized in order to protect their own uh, uh, fair return on their labor and their talents, the farmer has to face the fact he must do the same thing. Just uh, thinking about production all the time is uh, actually a, uh, a way of neglecting his own family. Because uh, I, I like the way Pope John put it in his letter on uh, the uh, social order. And uh, he said that nobody listens to a, an isolated voice nowadays. If you're not organized, uh, well, you're just neglected. So the farmer must uh, exercise his moral responsibility in order to achieve justice in the marketplace. Because any group in an organized society that is unorganized cannot expect to achieve uh, justice for labor or for, as in the case of farmer, for the investment that he has. Uh, and this, of course, is something that goes against the grain of many farmers because they aren't accustomed uh, sometimes to the restraints that, uh, uh, that uh, organized action uh, demands. Well, this is really, though, when you get right down to it, this is democracy in itself. This is what our nation was built on, our very government, on people working together for their mutual benefits. So I cannot uh, quite see it that they could even begin to think of it as a restraint. But uh, as you say, there is a distaste for doing something about their problem. I think that's no more than like in the little kid who, when he's sick, he doesn't like to take that medicine. It's bitter. He don't like the taste of it, but he's got to take it if he's going to get well. And so, as you said, all other industry, labor, everything in this nation is very, very highly organized. And the farmer is still an individual in the market going to giant corporations who are set up for the sole purpose of making a profit and asking them, what will you give me? Now, regardless of what anybody likes to believe about supply and demand setting a price, it is still a human being that finally puts the figure on it. And when the seller doesn't put the price on, the buyer is going to. And the man who puts the price on, when he has exclusive say, as it is in the farm market today, the buyer has the whole say, you can bet it's going to be in their favor. So the farmer has absolutely no choice but to do what industry has done, get together, what organize, to work together, labor, definitely. And I'd like to make this observation. You know, not, uh, none of us like uh, restraint, perhaps, but uh, I mean, restraints are a part of a good civilized uh, life, you know. And a farmer, or if, if farm people will not submit to uh, civilized restraints within uh, a bargaining structure of some kind for obtaining a decent price, uh, they have the other alternative uh, facing that they have right now. Look at the restraints that thousands of families have to submit to right now because of a, a very unjust return for labor uh, in their operation. I mean, the wife has to, uh, half of the, almost half the farm wives in, our, in one of our counties nearby are teaching school. I mean, uh, these are restraints that the average uh, farmer wouldn't want to, but that's the kind of restraints that he'll have to submit to if he's going to even uh, eke out an existence on the farm if he fails to organize. Well, the farmer does have the opportunity to get a price through organization, through collective bargaining. An NFO is set up nationwide right now that the farmers can have a price tomorrow morning once they decide they want to get in and cooperate with us. So I urge each and every one of you, join the NFO, you farmers, you businessmen in rural America, support it and get the farmer to see that he has to do something. Our problem is simple, once we're organized to face it. The U.S. Farm Report has presented as its special guests, NFO Vice President Erhard Fingston and Monsignor Louis J. Miller, South Dakota National Catholic Rural Life Director. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. 
The National Farmers Organization has been recognized as the leadership of agriculture and represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers.